And the Conservation Leadership Lecture Series for 2015 is graciously provided and sponsored by Bank of America. So we're really privileged to be involved with the BOA people. I know that Stephanie, Stephanie Gladden's here tonight. Stephanie, where are you? Stephanie, good job. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Stephanie's involved with community, community outreach and relationship building throughout Palm Beach County. And you know the bank is really focused, in our view, focused on giving people good advice, focused on good stewardship, community building, education, environmental responsibility. Those are all really key essential ingredients when your message is wildlife conservation. So Bank of America resonates with the Palm Beach Zoo. We're really proud to be associated with your organization, Stephanie, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, speaking of generosity, we're also lucky to have a very dear and old friend, Ruth and Ted Baum, here in the second row. Uh, Ruth and Ted were instrumental. They, other than this room, Ruth and Ted have provided really the only decent people facility that we have at the Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society. Thanks to Ruth and Ted, we have the Bomb Conference Room. We have the Bomb Conference Room in our Animal Care Complex, which is really an absolute first class facility. It's where we put our money into animals and animal welfare. So we're lucky to have supporters like Ruth and Ted, and thank you very much for being here. Tonight we also have board members here, Candy Ham, uh, Bob Duncan is here, um, let's see, Kathy Comerford, Dan Comerford's here, Kathy and Dan, where are you? There we go, pink jacket, you cannot miss that. And look at the shoes that Dan has on, Dan, can you, can you come out and model them? They're incredible. Anyway, these, these people know how to style, and we are lucky to have their support and leadership, and of course in the back, I'm not going to let, not let her sneak out too early, is our chairman, Michelle Kessler. Michelle, would you just stand up for a moment? Everybody, this person is unbelievable. Of course, my boss as well, so I'm very nervous here speaking in front of Michelle. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Upcoming events that we want to uh, just mention very quickly is a little bit of housekeeping. Let me see if I can try to use this. Upcoming events, we've got our Do With The Zoo on Friday, May 8th. Uh, that's going to be our second um, big fundraiser for the season. It's really neat cocktail party again in the George and Harriet Cornell Tropics of the Americas exhibit. We have a lot of restaurants there, uh, an, an open bar. It's a very expensive ticket, $175, but it's actually a steal because our other fundraiser, the ticket is $750. So I know that all makes me wince, but it's incredibly important for people to come and have a good time uh, if you can can afford. If you can't afford that, of course, there's also Roar and Pour on the following day, which is a little more affordable. And that will happen routinely on Saturday nights here at the zoo, thanks to our liquor license. And then if that's not really, a partying is not your thing, or it is your thing and you want to uh, erase however you feel, a week later is May 16th, Save the Tiger uh, 5K. That's our third Big Cat 5K. Uh, race series for the season. We've had Save the Panther, we've had Save the, Save, this will be Save the Tiger, in the fall we'll have Save the Jaguar. These are really important events. Not only are they good to get good runners out, we have some fabulous cross country runners in Palm Beach County, but family and friends can walk this and we raise money for conservation. This is a principal uh, fundraiser, our Save the Panther, for this uh, project we're going to talk about tonight, um, the Florida Wildlife Quarter. So these are important events. We appreciate your sponsorship. If you can can attend. And of course, our, our last uh, leadership lecture will happen on May, May 21st, and that will be, uh, let's see, that's with the Florida Public Service Commissioner, Ron Brise. That will be happening, uh, as I say, May 21, that's, a, that's a, also a Thursday night. These always happen on Thursday nights. We're going to be talking about renewable energy in the state of Florida, particularly solar energy. So that's important to us, that's important to the environment. If it's good for the environment, it's good for wildlife. And uh, we've been very committed to uh, developing solar power here on site, and we're going to have more to talk about that very soon. Uh, just, just maybe by a show of hands, how, how many people have been to this event before the Leadership Lecture Series in the room? Okay. And how many people are here for the first time? Wow, amazing. I told you guys were a big draw. <laughs> That's so great. Well, for those of you who haven't been here, of course, this is our third event out of four. Uh, back in January, we talked about the lovable and vulnerable creature, the manatee, a uh, population of about 5,000 animals going up and down the coast of Florida. 
Uh, so really talking about the, the human environment and uh, a human interplay with wildlife and with manatees in particular, a very vulnerable animal that we need to be aware of and we need to protect. Uh, it's also very um, uh, uplifting for all of us at the zoo to, for, and to share with you here that probably the, the most significant amount of research that's been done on the Florida <laughs> manatee has been funded by Florida Power and Light, your local utility company. Uh, Sarah Marmion is here with her husband Bruce. Sarah, where are you? So, all right, Sarah. So Sarah is uh, overseeing the, the groundbreaking and the development of the new Manatee Viewing Center, Manatee Education Center, so that's right there by the new power plant uh, on the line with, uh, between West Palm Beach and, and Riviera Beach. So, so that was a big event for us here. Our second event was in February. We talked about uh, urban agriculture, talked about local food production, what that means for wildlife habitat here in the state of Florida. We had Dr. John Zahina Ramos here for that. Uh, Dr. Z, are you here? Here we go, Dr. Z and Eddie are here, so it's great to see you guys back. If people in the room are interested in that, it's a very important topic. These two guys like to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, so that gets me to, to tonight, and, and we're very pleased to have uh, Mallory Likes Dimmitt and Carlton Ward Jr. return to us for what will tonight be their first public presentation on the second uh, wildlife corridor trek that they've done in the state of Florida. So this is, this is not a minor undertaking. These two folks have traveled a thousand miles in the last, I don't know, couple months. This time, the, the first trek they did a thousand miles in a hundred days. And that was from the tip of the Everglades to the Georgia border line at the Okefenokee Swamp. And that, you know, if you do, you know, I, I can do that math, that's 10 miles a day on your feet, walking or paddle boarding. Um, and <coughs> so this time, they went 1,000 miles in, in 70 days. And there are some accountants in the group here with Bank of America, so that's 14.28 miles per day. I was gonna say 15, but I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna overstate it. The cues of marketing, but you know, come on, 15 miles a day. So they they leaked out um, a couple days ago that they did bike a couple hundred miles. It wasn't all on foot, but still, it is an unbelievable thing. So if you guys want to do the talk tonight from your chairs, that's okay. Everybody will, everyone will understand. Uh, so we're very excited to have you, and, and I'm going to invite to the podium now uh, uh, Amber Landacre who is a vet tech here at the Palm Beach Zoo, to do the introductions for, for Mallory and, uh, and Carlton. Amber is, as I say, a vet tech. That means that Amber spends most of her day either with a microscope or with surgical instruments or mechanical ventilators and things like that. All of her time is spent with wildlife, but this is a very enthusiastic person who loves the outdoors and loves the environment. So it's my privilege to have uh, Amber Landacre, do the introductions tonight, Amber. Thank you, Andrew. Good evening. Tonight I have the honor of introducing two amazing conservationists, Mallory Likes Dimmitt and Carl Moore Jr. Mallory Likes Dimmitt is a multi-generation father who grew up exploring the lands of waters of Florida. Those experiences shaped her love of the outdoors and appreciation of the environment from a young age as well as her career choice in natural resource conservation and policy. She specializes in landscape scale conservation, natural resource management, ecosystem service markets, and water and energy issues. Previously, she worked for the Nature Conservancy in Telluride, Colorado, working with local, regional, state, and federal agencies and organizations on natural resource issues. She is the director, vice chair of the Corporate Responsibility Committee and a fifth generation committee's member of the Likes Brothers Incorporated, her family's Florida-based agribusiness company. Mallory coordinates the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition team and serves as the executive director. Mallory is an avid adventurer who has hiked the Appalachian Trail through Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia, which I appreciate because that's my area. And Carlton Ward Jr. is a conservation photographer from Tampa, Florida. His passion for nature was born from the Florida landscape, where eight generations of family history have grounded his perspective. He, he sees the natural environments and cultural legacies as the Earth's greatest yet most threatened resources. His 2009 book, Florida Cowboys, won a silver medal in the Florida Book Awards 
and for that work, Popular Photography Magazine featured him as one of three photographers working to save Vanishing America. Carlton's current focus is the Florida Wildlife Corridor, a public awareness initiative he established in 2009. In 2012, he co-led the Florida Wildlife Corridor Expedition with Mallory, a 100-day, 1,000-mile trek that explored the last remaining natural path through the length of the Florida Peninsula. Carlton's photographs are featured in magazines including Audubon, Smithsonian, Geo, Nature Conservancy, and National Wildlife. Limited edition prints are exhibited in galleries and museums and available through CarltonWar.com and by visiting Carlton Moore Gallery in Tampa, Florida. Tonight we have the privilege of being the first audience to hear about their latest quarter of Germany. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Miss Mallory Lights Dimmit and Carlton Moore. Um, we're going to take turns um, in different parts of this journey. How's my volume? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I need to find our remote control here. Okay, so this is sharing 70 days and a thousand miles of experience in 40 minutes might be as hard as the trek itself. So we'll see how this goes. We are the first victims of this presentation, so that's my caveat. But I'll start with a little bit of background. <clears throat> you can see here the overall view of the Florida Wildlife Corridor and what we're doing, but I'll, I'll take it back to the beginning of my involvement with this effort. And it was through the experience when I was out photographing those Florida cattle ranches, I learned about another multi-generation Floridian in the form of the Florida black bear. And it was this emblem to me of the wildest places left in our state that still have bear populations hiding in plain sight of our urban areas. And this interesting relationship how the private lands of the cattle ranches and the bears you know, the bears depended on the stewardship of the ranches. And that's kind of some of the underlying philosophy of what goes into wildlife corridors today. For example, this is a cattle ranch in Highlands County just on the other side of Lake Okeechobee where there's this bear population, which is my entree into this story. Back in 2006, this is the first Florida black bear I met up close and personal in 13 because our friend and expedition team member Joe Guthrie as a young master student then was putting a GPS tracking collar on the bear's neck. And what it told us, not that bear, this is M34, some 21 bears later in the study, this bear went on a huge walkabout. Here's Lake Okeechobee, here's the southern edge of the Lake Wales Ridge near Seabring. This bear traveled 500 miles in just two months in the summer of 2010. And it showed that from the perspective of a bear, we have a connected landscape that goes all the way to Interstate 4 near Orlando. We actually spend the night near Celebration before wisely turning around. <laughs> Cross the Avon Park Air Force Range a couple of times, going up and down around the edge of the Hoover River Dyke, all the way to Babcock Ranch over in Charlotte County. So this is kind of our mascot, if you will, an animal that shows us what is possible for large landscape conservation. So that opened up this whole area of question and started studying and looking at a lot of the research that's been going on for quite a long time on this topic. Here's a population projection. This is 2006 when Florida had just 16 million people. We have 20 million people now, red being the developed areas. And we look here, that's the projection from that point looking forward to 2060. And those numbers hold pretty well. They're calling for doubling of population from that point. So what does that mean for wildlife? These big sections of green habitat, um, if we're not careful, they'll become islands separated from one another. So that's the idea of wildlife corridors. And this map goes back to 1994, where biologists had already mapped out the green infrastructure. And that's what this is all about. It's about protecting the green infrastructure that allows animals to move from place to place and the water to flow. And that wasn't getting a lot of public attention at the time. So that's where we came in to try to put some public face to this opportunity and how important it is for wildlife and for water and for people in our state. So this is a map that shows 
the wildlife corridor and the vision to protect this green infrastructure through Florida. And what better way than to bring attention to that than to go on a thousand mile walk, or so we thought. So I found two people create as crazy as myself, and Joe Guthrie and, and Mallory, who you met, and we set off in January 2012 in the Everglades to show this path. And many of you saw this presentation before. I'm not going to spend much time other than just flash through some of these amazing landscapes at the Everglades, which are tied to the bottom of this system and arguably have the most at stake in this proposition of whether or not we keep things connected, because they could very easily get cut off from the rest of the peninsula. Moving up to the Everglades and fantastic wild places like the Fakahatchee Strand over on the western side near Big Cypress National Preserve, on up into places like Babcock Ranch and moving into the northern Everglades where bobcats share the same land with bears and panthers and cowboys, beautiful places like Avon Park. So we traveled up to the Everglades headwaters and take note of this, this is the halfway point of the 2012 trek and it's where we will begin, or where we began the January 10th journey that Mallory will share with you shortly. Places like the St. John's River moving forward. One of my favorite pictures from the first trip in the Okefenokee Swamp. And so, with every closing of one journey is the beginning of a new journey, which we're learning now, and it wasn't far into the first trek or into the planning that we, we became aware that we were leaving out an important part of the state, truly statewide corridor vision. And so we soon began planning the second part of the trek, which we've called the Glades to Golf Expedition. You see the line from the 2012 trek up the peninsula, and the 2015 trek starting with the red arrow moving off to the panhandle. So this is the area, and this is where the journey began on January 10th in the Everglades headwaters. back and forth, but this way you get to hear both of our stories. Um, so uh, we'll start this journey, as Carlton mentioned, in the Everglades Headwaters, and um, take you through some photographs from the Nature Conservancy's Disney Wilderness Reserve. And so um, this is an area right up against urban Orlando, and I think it's important um, for all of us here to think about you know, the Everglades watershed extends from the southern end of Orlando all the way down to Florida Bay and um, provides water for more than 7 million people. And so we wanted to start our journey there at the halfway point of our 2012 trek, um, and also to make sure that we were highlighting just how important protecting the, head the headwaters of the Everglades is to the total system. So here's some imagery from <coughs> Disney Wilderness Preserve, 12,000 acres. Just an incredible landscape. There's a group of ranchers in this area called the Northern Everglades Alliance, and together they represent over a million acres of private land ownership. You can't hear, you. can't hear me back there, okay? This is still on. So, turn this. Is that any better? Yes. Okay, great. That keeps us from having some interference there. So, the. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the Northern Everglades Alliance, as I was saying, is, is a land uh, group of landowners who represent over a million acres in, in private lands who are interested in seeing this area protected. And, and one of the most recent conservation proposals is called the Everglades Headwaters National Wildlife Refuge and Conservation Area. Together in a public-private partnership is a 150,000-acre landscape. And during our last check, we were um, we were overjoyed to spend, first of all, a couple of miles not walking under our own power <laughs> by uh, riding on horseback with this group of ranchers um, to the Disney Wilderness Preserve and really just spending time with them to see this landscape that they care about. You know, at that time, 10 acres of this eventual 150,000 acre um, conservation area had been protected, and that's still, a couple years later, the only 10 acres that have been purchased. So certainly we have a long way to go here, and we wanted to give credence to this landscape you know, by starting our trek here. And as you can see, of course, you know, uh, the wildlife corridor runs right up to the edge of Orlando, and one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the state. 
and, and you saw the map earlier where Carlton showed the projections of essentially Tampa and Orlando growing together. And so figuring out where to go across uh, Interstate 4 and connect over to the Green Swamp was a challenge. I should say that we spent more than a year planning this check before the 70 days of actually doing it. So it was so um, just a wonderful start to have a bunch of friends and family come join us at the, at the launch and also to have Senator Bill Nelson uh, be at our second off event. So. We started off that day on bike. Uh, via bicycle, we spent many miles traveling by bicycle in order to just physically make the distance. But um, one of the most significant crossings of the, of the second day of the trek was underneath Interstate 4. And so this is a, this is a ranch crossing that was actually constructed when the Interstate was constructed so that the landowner who happened to own both sides of the land could go back and forth um, underneath the Interstate it, for his cattle operation and business. But as you can see, it's low and it's dark and there's no natural light into it except from the very ends. And certainly it is not um, it is not a great wildlife crossing. So as part of this track, we're trying to bring awareness to the places that need improvements for wildlife habitat. We saw the story of the bear who couldn't get across the interstate. Places like this aren't necessarily making it easier, but there's a lot of work we can do as um, roads are retrofitted to be more wildlife friendly. So. When we did get to the other side, we had really incredible, beautiful private lands for a couple of days before we entered the Green Swamp Wilderness Preserve. We spent several days traversing the Green Swamp. This is um, <coughs> this is an area, like much of uh, Florida Wildlife Corridor, that is just hiding in plain sight, um, dead in the middle of Tampa and Orlando and other um, developed areas, but that is um, an incredible landscape of almost 500,000 acres spanning multiple counties that is still very wild operated as a, a wilderness preserve in cooperation with watershed, uh, water management districts and FWC. And we, this is our first backpacking of the trek. And you'll notice here that everything is looking pretty nice. And then, you know, there's some additional layers on. And I'll just point out from this very first week, we had a, a great cycle going where on our first unsupported day of each of our unsupported adventures, so many of them <coughs> We have a logistics coordinator in camp with us in the field. He had a vehicle with our gear and trailer. You know, we could cook on a bigger camp stove. He, he would do the grocery shopping, that kind of thing. Well, the nights when we were carry all of our own food and all of our own gear um, and fully unsupported was always the first wave of uh, a weekly storm cycle um, <laughs> that usually involved a cold front. So, you know, backpacking in Florida starts out warm and muggy. So much so you don't want to put your rain jacket on because um, you'll just, you know, get sweaty. And so when you eventually do, your art, it's already too late. And you're wet, and then you get more wet. And then you just decide to go right into the swamp and uh, wade straight in because you're already soaked through. And, you know, at this point, it doesn't matter. You just take your shoes off and get right out into the swamp and um, photograph and see what, what all there is to see. So. Uh, Green Swamp was definitely a highlight very early on, um, incredible landscape. We spent much time here following the Florida National Scenic Trail, a 1,400-mile trail that traverses much of Florida from Big Cypress all the way to the Alabama River. <coughs> we would use the trail several times during the trek, um, but it was just incredible starting here along the uh, headwaters of the Lipicucci River. And I should mention that Green Swamp is the headwaters before Florida's river system. So. Again, we went right from the Everglades headwaters to a very another important headwater system, really looking at you know, where Florida's rivers and water begins, including the water supply for the Tampa Bay area where Carlson and I both live. Um, so we also got to look at what is um, some land management techniques for the green swamp. And it's not every day you get to light a swamp on fire. Um, that was one of the highlights of the trek. Again, this is all in the first week. So we're going to pick up the pace here, but this is a controlled burn, um, which is important technique to replicate fire that would have occurred naturally on the landscape that now we have to put out oftentimes, but um, it's an important tool for um, plant regeneration and for native species who have involved with fire. After the end of the Green Swamp, we actually uh, biked our way west uh, over the Brooksville Ridge and to Chattawiska. And this is a little video of showing pretty much what it's like to come out of wildlands and in. <laughs> Uh, US 19. And so this is the north side <coughs> road connecting the Tampa Bay area, you know, all the way to Tallahassee and points beyond. Um, and it's a little bit daunting. And this is, you know, another major road crossing this time on bike. Luckily, there, there are some 
ways to get across traffic signal here. And um, but it took us to uh, it took us into the nature coast. And so this transition, if you zoom into the map here, it's going to show you Chazawiska on the south end, and then Crystal River, and then all the way up towards the Gulf Coast. And so Chazawiska is um, pretty much west of U.S. Highway 19, and is its own incredible watery world with many swamps, um, many swamps, but also freshwater springs found in Chazawiska. So here is one of them at the Head Springs. So we spent some time diving down, and you could actually connect from <coughs> one spot underneath this rock ledge and up to where the shafts of light are coming through. Here's our other member, Joe Guthrie, doing just that swim. And this is all, it's an incredible paddling destination. Um, and we spent several days in, in Chazawiska and in Crystal River um, and on the trip between the two. So again, the early morning fog really made the paddling quite scenic. And then we had excellent calm conditions as we paddled out of the mouth of the Chazawiska River into this place called Seven Cabbage Cut and worked our way north, paralleling now the Gulf Coast, um, you know, on the, on the grass edge. Uh, up to Crystal River. This is an Ozello, the fine people of Ozello, put us up for the night. We had a wonderful event there, with the Civic, hosted by the Civic Association. And um, paddled into Crystal River, spent a couple of nights in Crystal River, and then went out and around the Crystal River power plant and into um, an open water 18 mile paddle day across the Gulf. Luckily, the weather did cooperate for us on this part. Maybe the only time of the track that really did us right. Uh, <laughs> and into the mouth of the Wissapuchi River. So you, you'll notice that in the first week we were in the very headwaters of the Wissapuchi. At this point, in the end of the second week or start of the third week, we're, we're now at the mouth of the river and the Gulf. We took an excellent side trip over to the Rainbow River, one, another one of Florida's spring fed rivers that is very, very well protected in excellent shape and makes great uh, imagery. And then we spent several days paddling in and around Crystal River and of course you could not get enough of, of manatees. We were lucky in that um, the weather was getting cold and this cold front cycle and, and that had the, the benefit of really gathering manatees closer to the springs for the warm water refuge. And so we were at a time where um, you know we were able to swim with many manatees, witness manatee mothers and calves, um, and you know, it just it never gets old. So it's not always uh, an incredible experience. We biked on from Crystal River, uh, working our way north up and from Yankee Town up to the Cedar Keys. And what happened to that slide? And we'll just keep going here. And yeah, it was of course very wet. We're on these coastal hardwood swamps um, that make up really the, the edge of the Gulf Coast throughout much of the nature coast that were just incredible to traverse. We did have some good standing water. This is what the Lower Swanee River looks like from above. Um, and the Lower Swanee River opens up into the Gulf of Mexico very near the Cedar Keys. And so we spent some time in the Lower Swanee National Wildlife Refuge and all on the Cedar Keys themselves. And we also spent some time there with Play on aquaculture folks um, and the Cedar Aquaculture Association really understanding you know, the balance of Swanee River and the health of freshwater and the mixing of freshwater and saltwater and you know, it's essential for the survival of um, commercial fisheries that have been there for many generations but are constantly having to rain dead themselves. Um, this bird hung out at, at one of the seafood houses and uh, would, would get pretty close. So. We also enjoyed, as we were biking our way up through um, the nature coast, we spent many days biking up through the Big Bend Wildlife Management Area. And, um, and I highly recommend it. There are so many great, you know, it's a great bike trip. It's not very, very much traffic. But there are these regular intervals where you can make your way out west to the actual Gulf. And one of those spots is called Hagen's Cove. And Hagen's Cove which is an incredible um, gathering uh, birds, waterfowl, and uh, a long expanse of shallow water, um, and especially at sunset, was just gorgeous with the redheads here. And uh, at the very end of this stretch, we, we had the joy of swimming in Manatee Springs. And Manatee Springs um, was lucky enough to have a manatee while we were there, so that was nice. 
Um, but as you can see, there's not a whole lot for this manatee to eat. It's mostly that um, native vegetation has been overtaken by um, by this algae that um, is a real sign of nutrient enriched waters and a, a symbol of the health of Florida Springs. So that is something that was kind of hard to see, frankly. I've been um, spent, you know, grew up on the west coast of Florida, spent a lot of time in Florida Springs as a kid to go back to these places some um, 30 years later and see them in an entirely different state. You know, still somewhat beautiful, but knowing that, um, that we're, we're seeing the decline of these springs, you know, in my lifetime and all of our lifetimes. Well, it's kind of a depressing note to take us to um, the start of Carlton's journey here as we move further west um, from the end of the nature coast into the forgotten coast. So this area is um, This area is <clears throat> referred to as the Forgotten Coast, and it's um, a theme that applied to a lot of the areas we traversed through the Florida Panhandle. But this area is steeped in mystery and intrigue. We hiked by an area called the Ascilla River, where it literally disappears underground. And so at this point, this is a longer exposure where the water is swirling like a bathtub drain, and the river goes away. And then you hike further down the trail a few hundred yards, and it pops back up. Um, really an awesome thing to do if you ever get a chance up in the Big Bend. Here's a scene that shows um, streams and water that look like places you don't really commonly identify with Florida. Just breathtaking, almost like Appalachian Mountain streams, except we have a palm tree in the foreground to put the Florida stamp on it. And plenty of water. And this was you know, hiking on through St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge is really funny. I mean, I had my boots on and Mallory and Joe were up ahead and I was trying to walk around every puddle. And I did that, I don't know how much time I wasted for like the first two, three hundred yards until I realized the next four miles were going to be like knee deep in water. And so you just kind of go with it at some point. <clears throat> and you try to get to your tent in time where you can dry off. And that became a theme. You know, get there before it gets too cold and you can get out of your soaking wet clothes and um, it, it made it that much more memorable. This is a camp that when Mallory and Joe walked up to this place in the storm that's out on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, she said to Joe, it's like we're arriving at the end of the world because it's just this open expanse into the Gulf and those trees were all the protection we had from pretty strong winds that were coming through. We dried off the next day. <clears throat> just to get wet again. This is the Florida National Scenic Trail, which we enjoyed at a lot of places, like Mallory was saying. Well, the trail turns to this um, for about 100 or so yards uh, to get into the town of St. Mark's. And you can't see me because I'm behind the camera, but I'm trying not to drown. Because it is, for, for a Florida boy, this is cold. I mean, it's like 50-something degrees, and it takes your breath away when you first get in. You know, Mallory is cruising along, and I'm just trying to get a few pictures, but this was a good memory from that. Nearby, we actually went to stay on a property owned by Mallory's father, and this is a cool thing where in the 20 plus years, nearly 30 years that they've been up there south of Tallahassee, they've replanted these pine trees, and it's an awesome story of private land stewardship and the type of restoration that can be done on all sorts of scales. Some pretty charismatic turtle I got to hang out with when we were there. <laughs> a bit further down the coast, we were at Wakulla Springs, and there's a small spring nearby where there's this aggregation of mullet that came up into the spring head. It's so cool to see in that kind of clear water, just teeming with life, pretty um, tenacious greed, taking down a crayfish, which is a cool thing. <clears throat> and new adventures and new discovery every single day as we hiked through all these awesome places along the scenic trail. Um, it's a world-class trail system. People all over the place know about the Appalachian Trail, but we want them to know about the Florida Trail and how it coincides with the Florida Wildlife Corridor and can help bring people into these places that we're trying to protect. 
Mallory was our fearless leader for most of the trek, including here as we set a course in Bradwell Bay. And this is the Bradwell Bay Wilderness Area. It's one of the more remote parts of the scenic trail going through the 600,000 acre plus Apalachicola National Forest. And that stick is in hand because it's knee deep there, but it could be chest deep at the next pothole. So that's how we proceeded through this really wild and amazing stretch of the Bradwell Bay Wilderness. We did a lot of paddling. We paddled 16 different rivers on this trip. And that just includes the ones we actually made some progress up or down. We crossed over that many more again for sure. This is the Oklahoma River. Um, some breathtaking sunsets and views that we enjoyed. It was really winter and things were gray and, and there not much leaves on the trees, but it, it gave a really beautiful and stark background and, and set the stage for us to witness spring coming while we were paddling further and trekking further to the west. Had some cool onlookers like this otter. Nice river. You guys have some great otters here that I got to hang out with last time I was at the zoo. So I felt really um, privileged to have him poke the head out. This trip was a little bit different because um, we had even more of a media strategy. So every single week we wrote articles for the Tampa Bay Times and for our blog at National Geographic. And so that meant even when it was 28 degrees of ice on your tent, it's still better to be by the fire, and that's that's where Mallory was at the office, you know, hammering out the words for her article that a million people would have a chance to see in the Tampa Bay Times that next Sunday. So that's what it's all about for us is sharing the story. This I had the misfortune of having to get out of my tent in 20-something degree weather to go to the bathroom, but the, that's not happening there. I'm sorry. The, the light was. I mean, the stars would just blow you away. You don't see that. You forget about that when you live in the city. And so I had to put on all the clothes I had and sit on my tripod and do a long exposure at 4 a.m. because that's just what you do when you see something like that. I had a Luna Moth visit us one night while we were on the Apalachicola. Experienced amazing places like the Dead Lake. Some of these aerial shots are actually from the drone footage that our film team shot. So they shared, if you're wondering how we got these perspectives, during the trek, but just an otherworldly expanse of the Chipola River as it widens out as part of the Apalachicola system. We paddled five days down this river. It was really, really awesome. Um, again, we, we were on a new moon during that stretch. The stars were just bringing everything to life as we traveled through. Apalachicola is one of these anchors of the corridor. The forests there with the associated state forest and others are a million acres of conservation land. And it's a huge opportunity and it, it shows the importance of trying to maintain the connections to other conservation lands nearby. This is some managed forestry, which is a part of it. But at the end of our paddle into the town of Apalachicola, we came up around the shrimp boats and the shrimp docks, and that's really relevant there because it ties the human story to the wildlife conservation story. In Apalachicola, 80% of the people living there have someone either directly or indirectly in their family that's connected to the seafood industry. And it's shrimpers and people going out on the water every day. And it's also the very well-known Apalachicola oysterman. And this man, Kendall Shellis, is someone I met while working on a story for the Nature Conservancy in the region. And we got to go out with him and spend a really memorable day. These, these pictures were shot previously. But he caught oysters off his lease. His family's been there since the 1800s. They still do it manually. And you know what they're doing is providing food for everyone, but also providing the structure and the shells that the other wildlife appreciate. And it, it brings into focus the, the livelihoods that are truly at stake if, if we don't keep the waters flowing clean and the, and the water flowing in a natural way that can sustain the wildlife and the fisheries. More hiking, more wet hiking. And I, I shouldn't, I mean, it, it was really, really awesome. Some of my most enjoyable times on the trail were when the rain was coming down and you feel alive and you feel the connection. You can imagine those raindrops moving their way down through the pines and the creeks and ending up in the bay going through those oysters just two or three days later. It brings it all together. This is Mary on the Econ Fine Creek where Joe was getting some really awesome pictures of these rapids in the foreground. And sometimes the beauty is just waiting for you right beneath your feet. This is a set of Lubin Mallory. Um, 
And just the way it was holding on to the morning dew, still three or four hours into the day, it's, it's in the longleaf pines, it's one of the most biologically rich forest types in our country. And it's something we got to explore quite a bit of as we pushed further and further west into the frontier of the Panhandle. So this last region of the state, um, the coastal marketing is called the Emerald Coast, but then it's associated with this vast complex of pine forest, including Eglin Air Force Base and Blackwater River State Forest and others. So we got to dip down to the coast and experience the beautiful Gulf beaches near Watercolor and, and Santa Rosa Beach and Topsail Hill State Park. We, met up with some folks and went paddle boarding. See, one of the things we did every single Saturday, this is Mallory's idea and she brilliantly implemented where we had like up to 75 people come paddle or hike with us on things called trail mixers every Saturday. This day was blustery and there were maybe 30 or 40 hardy souls that came out, but we, we went out and I had to try to go out with the kids and surf the paddle board, which ended in, once again, getting wet. You know? <laughs> Camera on my neck was waterproof, thankfully, in that case. But the springs and the fresh water are never far away, and this is a blending of spring water with Tannic River water as it moves its way downstream. Here, we think about the everyday headwaters that are you know, a little bit further away, but provide water for seven million people. There, it seems like as we went along, you know, whether it's in the Econ Fina or the Perdido, all these communities downstream get all their drinking water from these rivers. So it's really neat to travel the length of them and see those connections. This was supposed to be video that showed the water bubbling by, so just imagine it bubbling by. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got to do some really cool stuff with the paddle boarding and the bicycling, and we're in an area called the, went to a place called the Ngozi Plantation with the E.O. Wilson Biophilia Center, named after the primitive biologist E.O. Wilson, who I photographed previously here for Smithsonian Magazine, um, looking at a pitcher plant. And this is the site of the largest private longleaf pine ecosystem restoration on the planet. There's something like 8 million trees that they planted, 10, 15 years old, bring, aiming to bring it back to what it was two or 300 years ago. It's also a great place for gopher tortoise restoration and the site of another cool conservation story where we walked under a busy road called 331 going from the private land of Negosi Plantation to the nearly 500,000 acre Eglin Air Force Base on the other side of this road. This, this was newly built, there's three of them going in this area and it's a real model of what we need to do with future roads to keep these landscapes connected. They're dropping off our food and our, and our beer for us at this point. <laughs> You know, this is Air Force Special Tactics training at England Air Force Base shot previously, but I wanted to show the context because this is this same place, and it's some of the wildest part of the Florida Saint Trail, 250,000 acres open to the public, and lots of, you know, arguably some of the best conservation land in our country that is under the management and stewardship of the Department of Defense. They've restored the streams and the waters. <clears throat> this is a biologist in this Clearwater Creek that we are seeing, you know, every few miles creeks like them on the scenic trail crossing through where there's a fish called the Okaloosa darter that they were doing restoration for and they brought this fish from the second one you know put on the endangered species list in 1973 and it's on its way it's been listed removed to threatened status and hopefully going to be delisted in the near future. <clears throat> we had people like Commissioner of Agriculture Adam Putnam hike with us there's Ian Mallory or talking shop as they walk on the Florida Scenic Trail through Eglin Air Force Base. It's um, really great to have the support of agencies and elected officials like Commissioner Putnam who really get the way this vision works for the future of agriculture and for wildlife in Florida. More beautiful rivers like the Shoal River and the Yellow River and little signs of fall hanging on. The Samaras are the seed pods from the red maple trees were a, you know, just a flash of color that we got to experience every day as we paddled. Um, you know, still coming closer to spring. This is Blackwater River, Blackwater River State Forest. And these forests are really the heart and fabric of the wildlife corridor in the Panhandle. And this is an area where um, it looks more like it used to look 
few hundred years ago. This once covered 90 million acres of the southeastern U.S. from the Carolinas all the way around to Texas, and it's been reduced to 3% of that historic range. It just so happens, we learned this during the expedition, that Blackwater River State Forest sits amidst amongst the largest contiguous longleaf pine forest left on the planet. It goes from there to Eglin Air Force Base in the north to Connecticut National Forest in Alabama. So right there in the northwest corner of Florida, we have a quarter of the world's remaining longleaf pine trees and a real opportunity and a success story for regional conservation and a chance to connect up those landscapes back to the west or back east to Apalachicola and, um, and, and really have a, a world-class conservation landscape that spans throughout the whole northern part of the state. I'm just going to share some of the creatures um, that we got to see you know, just in the day or two we were there photographing. Oh, no, oh, I, don't, I don't know the name of the insect. This, this is a Cuban anole, or, or I mean, not a Cuban, that, that's one I would not photograph. No, that's a, that's a Carolina anole, a green anole, the native one that we're supposed to have here. Um, that's a damselfly. That's a damselfly. Yes, see, there's always someone. Come to the zoo and know that you'll have the answers for you. <laughs> Dress rehearsal for future presentations. But we spent a couple days with the film team looking for the red cockaded woodpecker, and we got to climb up some trees and see these really cool birds that really rely on the pine forest and are coming back. They're still endangered species, but they're coming back with the restoration efforts to get those mature pine trees back on the landscape. So we're moving our way back towards the coast, towards our finale, and we're seeing signs of spring and signs of life, um, like the spittlehead fern springing up in the rainwater preserve on the Perdido River. And more stars, because I really can't resist, but hanging out with all these videographers, you want to try their tricks. So I did a time lapse that showed the way the stars and the clouds are moving that night over the Perdido River. We took one more really memorable side trip, and there's this fish called the alligator gar that the Fish and Wildlife Commission is studying. They get to be like three, four hundred pounds, can live nearly a hundred years, and there's only thought to be a few hundred of them left in these wild rivers in northwest Florida. You can see it underwater there. I don't know why. I just had to get in the water to try to get this picture, but once I saw it up close, it was pretty startling. <laughs> You can see um, you can see Mallory and Joe kind of working it back into the water, but this stuff will be in the film. I mean, the filmmakers captured this story, and we'll share it in more than I can share here. But as we worked our way down the Perdido River, we came into the marine environment again and paddled across the bays near Pensacola. And here's a picture of our final day, and we're we're back reconnected with the Gulf of Mexico. We're still somehow friends after being with each other day in and day out. And um, we get to the coast and we're kind of drawn to get into the Gulf of Mexico. It was the Glades to Golf journey and this was kind of summoning us. It was like was spring break kind of weather, beautiful, sunny. And um, we got to hang around and do some more photography. Of course, some more interviews. This is Mallory doing her exit interview. So we'll have a, a, a really great film this fall to share this story. And so that... Um, that sums up about two years of our lives in about uh, 40 minutes that Mallory will come up and share some of the lessons learned and some of the conclusions from this journey. friends and uh, patrons of the zoo for your generous sponsorship of this trek, um, which I hope that we conveyed pretty quickly was a trip of a lifetime, an honor to, to get to do for 70 days. And our mission has such an incredible overlap with the zoos. Um, we take great pride in sort of showing you the habitats of some of the zoo's inhabitants and what it looks like out there in the wild. Um, many of Florida's iconic species could not you know, exist in the future without the Florida Wildlife Corridor being protected. So, kind of taking us from the you know, visibility of the check to what our work looks like going forward. And for example, this is a, this is a map showing the gopher tortoise habitat in Florida, uh, potential habitat for the gopher tortoise, which you can see is a pretty widespread species found throughout Florida, but all the red is, is um, 
know, that habitat, you can see the direct overlap with the Florida Wildlife Corridor in shades of green. And the same can be said, of course, for Florida Panther. This is potential Florida Panther habitat um, directly tied to the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And go back to our, our icon here in the Florida Black Bear, and seven populations found in the state of Florida. And it's, again, direct overlap with the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I think the takeaway from this expedition for each, each of us really was that our travels statewide in both of these expeditions prove that the corridor does exist right now. We're able to walk across it, bike, swim, wade, paddleboard, um, uh, the, the corridor north-south and from east to west. So it's there and it's still connected, but our challenge is really to keep it that way. And so you know, the work is, is just beginning. It's the, the future existence of the corridor that's at risk. Um, so for example, this is a map of Florida Forever projects. And I think a lot of you know that last November, 75% of the voters in Florida <laughs> An absolutely incredible feat too, where the voters you know, gave a mandate to our legislature to provide funding through the um, conservation trust funds annually for the preservation of Florida's land and water. Where uh, the rubber meets the road is really in the implementation this year of, of Amendment 1, and, and uh, the story is not as rosy. And so directly during the trek, Carlson and Joe and I actually showed up to Tallahassee in our, in our hiking clothes, not your normal you know, lobbying clothes, and um, were there as part of uh, one of the committee meets just to advocate to remind uh, you know, our, our elected officials that there is a clear vision for um, the state of Florida and, and, and our wildlife and natural areas. Not only the Florida Wildlife Corridor, of course, it needs protected, but that our work is not yet done. And there's so much to do, and it's important to do so. And so we ask each, each of you to help us sort of reiterate that message. The time to do that is really right now. And so on your chairs, every person here has uh, 10 things you can do to help support a wildlife corridor. I'll start with the easiest one, and that is pretty much just get outside. We hope that our tech has inspired you to get outside. It's good for you. And by, if you can expose someone else, your favorite park or preserve or area, you're <coughs> helping to really steward critical support for these places. Places actually need visitation in order to be maintained in the long run. So do your part, get outside. The second thing I hope that everyone can help us do tonight is to share the story of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. You can follow along. We do uh, daily social media, and it, we have all sorts of images from the track. You saw just the start of the you know, some 40,000 photos that were taken. We have something like eight terabytes of film data that came from this track. We'll be continuing to tell the story um, of this in our previous expedition, and we hope that you will follow along. Um, on our website and on our social media. Everything from the trek, we've tried to tag with that place all hashtags, so if you're interested, you can search via that. If you can take this card that's on your table and pass it on to one other person and tell, tell them about Florida Wildlife Corridor and get them to follow them, that does a tremendous amount of good. And really are, are willing to take the next step and um, we get the gold star here, and that is to advocate um, for the protection of Florida's land and water. And, uh, the, one, one way you can do that, and that we're, we're asking everyone here to do, is to sign up. Um, actually, the zoo is going to pass around some sign-up sheets during the, our question and answer. If you are willing to send an email, make a phone call, or let your legislators know that you support protecting the Florida Wildlife Corridor and implementing Amendment 1, which was passed this last year, um, to, to put more funding into land and water conservation than is currently on the budget, we ask you to do that now. The legislature is in session until May 1st, and um, what they've approved right now is a, is a paltry sum, and so it takes um, all of us direct action. So we have a form going around, and I'll just say one more time, if you are willing, if you put your email address down, we will send you the talking points. We will make it super easy for you to just reach out to your, your elected officials and let them know that you support more dollars for conservation. And, um, Actually, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew now to kind of talk about the next steps before we do our question and answer. Right now, I'm going to stand over here so I don't kill anyone's ears. But um, but uh, definitely, we we it's inspiring, certainly to us, all of us who work at the zoo, 
to see these people dedicate their professional lives to being outside and then helping us just by bringing these photographs and films. So uh, I, I couldn't be more proud to have them. And I, I know I speak for all our volunteers and staff members. So please, let's have a big round of applause. do is uh, we'll have a question and answer section in just a second, but we want to make a couple points that, you know, th this, our real purpose for being here, the reason we have animals on exhibit, we present them for people and to talk about these things, is uh, really to inspire people, all of us, ourselves included, those of us who work here, to act, meaning to do something on behalf of wildlife. So with this, uh, with this, these clipboards that we're passing around, we're asking for email addresses, you're not committing to anything, we're just trying to uh, present to you, uh, make it simple to act on your own to support this sort of thing, build awareness uh, for wildlife corridors and how important it is to preserve these habitats because as Eric Salaji, President and CEO of uh, Florida Power and Light says, you know, Florida it, it is the prize and there are a lot of people who don't live here today and would like to live here someday and when they come here we want it to be as beautiful as it is today. So we have to work hard, we have to act on behalf of wildlife in the natural world. And, and so that's why we invite you to these lectures tonight and, uh, and we'll have questions and answer sessions. But what we're gonna have after the Q&A, uh, right outside we'll, we'll have a book signing. Uh, Carlton's got uh, two of his books here, so there'll be book signings to do. These prints are available as well. They're absolutely beautiful. And we will be, uh, we have a table also. Our membership manager, Amanda Joy, will be outside. We're gonna uh, sell hats, try to sell uh, beautiful hats from the wildlife corridor and from the zoo as well. We have memberships uh, that are available, family memberships to give you access to the zoo all year long for a very low price or on up to the Big Cat Society, which, which is a real uh, a significant contribution of $1,000 a year, which is hugely important for us. So all these things, whether you want to get spend a couple bucks for a, rec for a fridge magnet or spend a dollar on reusable bags, you don't have to do use plastic bags at the grocery store, or buy a hat or, or join the zoo, become a member. All of the things that we raised tonight, all the net proceeds are going to support this wildlife corridor program and this project because we are really proud of these folks and what they're doing. So one more round of applause for now. for them. We have a microphone that we can bring around. We'll just spend a few minutes Q&A and, uh, and when we run out of gas, uh, please come on up and, and we can talk directly. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for sharing your story and beautiful pictures. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart. A couple of years ago I got involved in the Florida Land and Water Legacy and I was one of the petitioners to get it on the ballot. And I had a broken foot and I still hobbled around to get people to sign the petition. So, um, one of the things that I'd like to ask you, and uh, you touched on it, I was pretty frustrated when I saw how little funding was actually going towards the land and water legacy. And it seems like a bait and switch like they do with the lottery system. So we, the citizens, had a mandate of over 70%, about 75% of us, that want this funded. So uh, that's supposed to be part of our Constitution. So what, besides you know, signing these petitions or calling our senators and, and congressmen, what else can we do? Because we voted, and that was supposed to happen, and now they're playing games. So what what can we do? Yeah, that is a great point, and I hear your frustration, and I think um, you know many of us do have that same frustration. And so, you know, I think it's up to each of us to communicate how frustrated we are with the um, you know amounts of the, the over seven hundred million dollars that is available in this year for land and water conservation which a very paltry sum is said it's actually in the budget for Florida forever. And so what we've decided to do is to really talk about, you know, with takes kind of follow-up, 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 but in uh, a message of hope and with a lot of recent patience. <laughs> so we have a legal recourse because if that was the vote, that's what they're supposed to do. And it's like they're violating what was voted on for the Constitution. And it's not yet over yet for this session, and you know it's coming to a pretty quick close. It seems clear that the headlines today said that we might not have a budget at the end of this session. So I don't know what that means legally, and I'm not the policy expert on that. But I do know that as we've gone to Tallahassee with the map of Florida Wildlife Corridor, and we overlay 
Florida Forever, and we talk about the 1.15 million acres of Florida Forever lands that are not yet protected in the corridor. The 77 percent overlap with Florida Forever at the Florida Wildlife Corridor. People are listening, even legislators who you think you know we, we are who don't come from a conservation background really have no idea what a wildlife corridor is. When you can tell the story of walking for 70 days and coming here and talking about you know, what Florida means and, and also that we're not yet done. You know, the Florida, there's a myth going around in Florida that we have more public land you know, than we could ever need and conservation lands aren't being well managed. Well, nothing is further from the truth. You know, we've walked now 2,000 miles or traveled 2,000 miles in the state. We've never been anywhere that is not well managed uh, there. We have to top the management in, you know, anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. Um, our legislature has cut those management budgets, and staff have figured out how to still do an incredible job with less resources. And so I think, you know, part of it is just is just telling the story and uh, making sure you're actually meeting with people, you're using that to give hope, you're continuing to reiterate the importance of this, and make sure that we don't give up. No, that was that was a good answer. <laughs> oh no, this is gonna be a hard one. No, it's really gonna be on the same subject, and I think you need to sort of match hope and horror at the same time, or otherwise we all give up and go home and cry. But uh, in the hope side, I think you touch briefly. You might tell us a little bit more about the federal program for the Northern Everglades because we're looking at a combination of uh, buying and easements that work in with what the wildlife program thing is all about to take in that area beyond just the Kissimmee Basin. So that's a plus. I think the second thing, you probably didn't count enough, is if people would give you all some money, because they can do on the Florida Wildlife Corridor side, then you will keep on keeping on doing all of the good things you're doing. They're helping you with the rest of it. Thank you. So, the third thing on the, the hope side is the money the legislature did set aside last session to the family farm on people who really wanted to ranch. They didn't just want to pretend to ranch. They didn't just want to hold it. And I think the wildlife corridor has had more influence on making that work and making people and last year they had a line of ranchers who wanted to sell the right to develop their property. And there was money, but not enough money to go around and it's one thing the legislature is interested in. So that's funny. On the horror side, I don't think we did the horror quite horribly enough, which is we are facing the greatest stone wall that has ever been presented in my lifetime in everything from South Florida Water Ranch to District of Tallahassee that says, oh! You pass the water and land legacy amendment. I think we'll build some sewer plants. I think we'll build some reservoirs to supply more water to sugar. I think we'll do the water quality thing. We promise the court will do. If there is nothing else you do in your lifetime, they've got the phone, sign every petition that comes by, send every email you can to your particular legislature. Just tell them. I What was worse, the uh, cold weather, being wet, or the mosquitoes? <laughs> well, we have to compare 2012 to 2015 to fully answer that question. Because, because we were um, we were fortunate that the cold weather kept the mosquitoes at bay. Um, I don't. I mean, I, they all hide the experience. Really, it's all pure feeling. I, I, I love the mosquitoes and I love the cold and wet. I think that's my answer. <laughs> much more um, cold. Carlson was showing you photos of the Appalachian Cola. I'll tell you that the field's like temperature was 18 degrees. And uh, I spent 10 years in Colorado and I was scared for 18 degrees um, because you get the, the cold front come through brings driving rain first so your, your things are fully so we actually took an emergency trip to Tallahassee to double up our cold gear because I had one set of everything. I needed a dry set and a set that could potentially get wet. So there's a photo sitting around the fire, you know, where I'm typing uh, on the computer. What you don't see there is that on that same fire, I put my gloves out with sticks 
you know, into it, it right in front of the smoke so that they would dry out overnight. When I woke up in the morning, they were frozen solid like this. Um, so anyway, it was cold. But as Carlton said, it's character building. And, uh, and so we were really, I think, overjoyed. And there was a part of this check kind of midway through. I'm like, this is not that fun. And it went all wrong. But, you know, like, love the outdoors. Uh, our last check was really fun. And then it started to warm up, and the fun returned. So there's something to be said about you know, warmer temperatures. You actually get to swim. You're enjoying it. You start to actually goof off more. And that, um, there's a direct correlation for all of us students, I think, with the sunshine and warmth. Okay, one last question. One last question, Mallory. Did, did you make your father become a conservationist, or did he work on you? When did you start? Uh, it's a it's a mutual passing back and forth. So I would say that you know, of course, my parents um, provided the inspiration for me to get outside at a young age and exposed me to you know so much of what Florida had to offer. We spent a lot of time paddling um, Florida's rivers and and spending time camping in you know, Mayaka State Park and other places like that. And even where I grew up, just kind of exploring the bay. You know, I had a lot of free time to do that kind of thing, and that was the influence of my parents. I definitely think that now, in, in my conservation career, as I sort of continue to study and then take these kind of adventures, they want to join. And there's a picture of my other dad, so both my dads joined with this trek. My mom, siblings, you know, and so I think it's been a, a great sort of inspiration to pass it back and forth. And I think we're all, we all do that um, to our families and friends, and so that's why we ask you to share this story, because, you know, if you tell your siblings and your kids about this, you know, it helps the ripple effect, so thank you. One of the most humbling and encouraging things that's happened out of this whole enterprise is that you guys here at the zoo took up your own expedition and that um, you know really inspires us back i mean to see to see people connect with this gives us the kick to keep going and keep taking this story to the lawmakers and to the public and, and keep getting out there so thank you for all of your help in that just to fill in the details on that uh, as as Carlton says, we were, as a staff, were inspired last year when we heard the story of the first Florida Wildlife Corridor trek. So we, we made a pledge, and we promised, uh, we promised Carlton and Mallory that we would do uh, a trek from the ocean to the lake. I think we've got a slide here. From the ocean, uh, from Hope Sound to uh, the Lost Trailhead at Lake Okeechobee, and we had a great number of staff members participate in that. And we had uh, four staff members in particular, that uh, three of which are here tonight, that I want to identify and ask them to come up, give them a round of applause, and we have something for them. It's a real treat. But this is a 63-mile trek that they did over over four days, which is not a thousand miles. But when you work full time at the zoo, it is an extra burden uh, that we have uh, inspired ourselves to go and do. Anyway, this is this is really great stuff. But there's Tracy Schillinger here, and Amber uh, Amber. Landacre and Brooke Sexton, are you here? So you gals, will you please come up? These three gals uh, did the entire It's a favorite play of four days from uh, Ocean to Lake. And uh, so we want to congratulate them and get a picture with Carl and Mallory. And we want to present, let's see. Original uh, Michael Regan prints with uh, the pledges signed by by Carlton and myself. For oops, the light's really bad. Anyway, this is for you guys, and congratulations. And all of your everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you, Carl. The book signing will be going on. And please hang around and glass of wine. Thank you for supporting the zoo.